Why waste time with rigor and quality when you could just p-hack your way to stardom? Kidding aside, this video is part of a series of videos on p-hacking, what it is, and why it's so dangerous for science. I give a pretty detailed high-level explanation of p-hacking in the first video in this series, so if you're not familiar with the idea, please have a look there first. I'll make sure to put a link to that below. But in a few seconds, researchers are motivated to get what's called a p-value to be below a threshold of 0.05. If they do that, their findings are considered meaningful, and they can typically publish their results. If they don't, well, all their work is largely wasted. And to get those p-values below 0.05, there are some very dubious and unethical approaches that they can take. In this video, we'll dig into one of those unethical approaches that researchers can use to p-hack their data, by stopping data collection when the results are good. Welcome to Data Demystified. I'm Jeff Gallick, and today we'll dig deeper into p-hacking so that you can understand how to spot it when you see research results and avoid it when you do research yourself. The goal here is to build intuition, so we'll avoid heavy duty math and statistics and focus on what you really need to know. So let's jump in with a simple example to make this clear. Let's pretend I run a coffee shop, but not just any old coffee shop. This one uses what we call pay what you want pricing. Basically the price of a cup of coffee is whatever you wanna pay. I know this sounds crazy, but there are actually plenty of examples of this type of pricing scheme all around the world. I think the idea is that most people will feel responsible in paying something, so in the end, everything more or less works out. Anyway, let's pretend that I'm really interested in who is more generous with how much they pay, men or women. So I set up a simple research study. I record how much everyone chooses to pay for coffee, and then compare the men to the women. Easy enough. Now, without getting into the weeds and the statistics, to compare the averages across two groups, I conduct something called a t-test, and that test gives me a p-value. If the p-value is below 0.05, I conclude that there is a statistically significant difference in the average amount paid by men and women. If the p-value is above 0.05, I can't draw that conclusion. Okay, so let's run our little study and see how it unfolds. As people come into the coffee shop, I update the average price paid by them and everyone who came before them, and then I'm going to plot the p-value that I get when I make the comparison between men and women, every time someone else comes in. As you can see, the p-value fluctuates a lot, and that's because sometimes you get a person who pays a lot for coffee, and sometimes you don't. When in our series of customers that happens, however, is totally random. So as time passes, you can see that the p-value bounces around, and then, oh wait, here we go. With that last customer, the p-value just dropped to 0.04, which is below our threshold of 0.05, and so we have a statistically significant result. We now know that women pay more than men, or do we? Before we see just why this is a p-hacked result and not necessarily reflective of reality, if you could take a moment to like this video, subscribe to this channel, and click that little bell icon so that you don't miss out on any new content I put out, I'd really appreciate it. With that said, let's see why what I showed you is actually p-hacking. In this example, the choice to stop collecting data was made entirely based on the p-value that I observed at every point in time. I didn't stop earlier when the p-value was above 0.05, but I did stop it the moment it fell below 0.05. And the problem here is that p-values fluctuate a lot as data are collected, especially when our sample sizes are pretty small. In reality, in most cases, p-values will converge to their true levels with a large enough sample size. But before that happens, the fluctuations can be quite large. In our coffee example, if I let time continue and more customers come in, I might have found this, that the p-value quickly jumped back above 0.05 and then settled in somewhere around 0.20 and 0.20 is well above our threshold of 0.05, leading me to conclude that there doesn't appear to be a difference in how much men and women pay for coffee. But because I chose to continuously check my p-value as every new customer arrived, and stopped exactly when the p-value had happened to drop below 0.05, that is some serious p-hacking. And p-hacking here dramatically increases the rate of false positive results, or results that appear meaningful but actually have no relationship with reality. Now to be clear, it is absolutely possible that with more customers, we would continue to find a strong reliable difference between how much men and women pay on average and that p-value would have stayed well below 0.05. But because we stopped collecting data, we would never know. In other words, when you collect data, you can't just decide 
on how many observations you'll have on the fly. Rather, you have to say in advance that you plan to collect data from, say, 500 customers, and only then conduct your statistical test and see what the associated p-value is. If it then falls below 0.05, well, you can be reasonably confident that you have a statistically significant result. And if it doesn't, you can't just keep collecting data in hopes that you might find something eventually. This idea of selecting when to stop data collection based on what p-value happens to be observed is a very big and very common form of p-hacking. But to combat it isn't all that hard. Many academic journals now require researchers to actively state that they are pre-specifying how many participants they will have in every experiment and then not deviate from that. I mean, I suppose some people might still lie about this, but if they do that, now they're turning to straight up fraud, something I don't think too many people are willing to do. I hope you now understand a bit better this one form of p-hacking, adding more participants to make your results work. In the other videos in this series, I cover three other forms of p-hacking, as well as a tool that can be used to detect p-hacking in published work. And if there's a form of p-hacking that you want to share with me that I'm not covering, please leave a comment below, and I'll make sure to keep the conversation going. Finally, as always, thanks so much for watching.